there's not much reason for the Fed to rush to cut rates. It seemed like they were trying to anticipate things more than anything. And uh, if that's the case, everyone's got to adjust their expectations, adjust to a world where we're going to be above a 5% short-term treasury rate for a while longer. And that could lead to a correction in stocks like what we saw begin on Wednesday. Valuations are now more overstretched than ever, especially in the cyclical sectors, including information technology. So what should investors do? Should we take profits now? How should we position ourselves? This is the theme of our conversation with our next guest, Chance Vinukin, CIO of Oxbow Advisors. This episode is brought to you by Moomoo. Chance, welcome back to the show. Always good to see you. Yeah, great to be back, David. Let's talk about uh, your market outlook, your positioning, uh, most importantly. But first, some recent market news. As you know, this week, the CPI numbers came out. The Fed also released their minutes from their last meeting. Uh, the markets did not react well to both or either of these events that happened on Wednesday. As you know, there was a big slide uh, for the stock markets. Is this the beginning of a broader correction or are markets just reacting to the fact that perhaps the Federal Reserve will not cut rates anytime soon because inflation came in hotter than expected. It's so difficult. We're not trying to predict what's going to happen in the very near term, yeah. but it wouldn't surprise us if this was the start of a broader correction, just because at the beginning of this year, investors were hoping for six or seven rate cuts by the Federal Reserve in 2024. We thought that was way too optimistic. Uh, it was you know, maybe just a few at most. Now, after that CPI report on Wednesday, we're looking at maybe two cuts are expected for the rest of the year, and that wouldn't even start until September. There may not be any at all. Uh, we think that the inflation number, the, the CPI figure could stay above 3% for the rest of the year. And unless something really uh, damaging happens, either in the credit markets or the overall economy, there's not much reason for the Fed to rush to cut rates. It seemed like they were trying to anticipate things more than anything. And uh, if that's the case, everyone's got to adjust their expectations, adjust to a world where we're going to be above a 5% short-term treasury rate for a while longer. And that could lead to a correction in stocks like what we saw begin on Wednesday. Well, the CPI number has been above 3% for, for a long, long time. And people have commented exactly the way you did. It hasn't come down. So why has the market not yet re-rated its valuations? In other words, why are people, markets in particular, still expecting three or four rate cuts down the line, you think? I think it, part of it is communication, maybe problems by the Fed. They have been trying to be too prescriptive with how many cuts and in a certain timeline. And I think everyone got very attached to that number that there were going to be six cuts this year, and then there were going to be three or four. If they left it more open-ended, I think maybe people would have adjusted more quickly to what the data is actually saying, which is that inflation is still a bit higher than what the Fed and, and the government would like. And growth hasn't really faded yet. So there's not a big need to try to rush to cut rates based on what the Federal Reserve has done historically. Uh, usually what's caused them to cut rates is seeing a real drop off in the economic growth rate. We're not seeing that yet. So uh, there's really nothing for them to do, but they're kind of caught because they've been talking that way about rate cuts for some time. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about your positioning first before we get into your um, uh, macro outlook. Which positions have been Oxbow's most successful calls uh, or picks over the last year, you would say? Most successful would probably be two or three areas. Uh, so first, it's been good if you're just thinking about income and bonds. We've been very focused on just short-term maturity treasuries, that 5% yield, rather than trying to make too big of a call in 10-year treasuries, 30-year treasuries. And so far year to date, if anything from a five-year treasury out to a 30-year treasury has a negative total return you were best placed to be short term. So if you're just looking for a uh, very consistent income, safe income, that's been the better place to be. In terms of riskier assets, we've been adding over the course of the last year to our positions in the energy sector and the precious metals sectors. And we think that that's been a trend that can continue where you get a little bit higher commodity prices. The oil price has gone up 25% year to date. The CRB commodity index is up 15% year to date and gold's at record highs again. Mm -hmm. That's a good situation, and it doesn't seem like there's uh, an end to that trend just yet. So we're holding those positions that we've added over the last six to nine months, uh, and it's worked out for us. We're going to continue deep diving into Oxbow Advisor strategy and portfolio allocation. But first, a shout out to our sponsor, Moomoo, which is a trading platform that I find very unique. And what I like about Moomoo is that it's not just for trading. Here on our channel, we stress education and Moomoo 
does just that. It provides a suite of educational tools that you can use to further your own knowledge and insights as an investor and as a trader. So for example, you can click on options in Moomoo and there you'll find any relevant course that you choose. Moomoo also provides a whole series of study plans that are easy to use and follow. There's a step-by-step -step guide that you follow, simply follow along and you'll learn. For example, there's also trading simulations that you can use that replicate the feel of real trading without using uh, real money involved. And so there's a lot of benefits to using Moomoo from an educational perspective and not just for trading. Click on the link down below to learn more. And also right now for a limited time offer, there is a uh, there's an offer here that if you deposit $100, you'll get seven free fractional shares of a Magnificent 7 uh, portfolio and 5.1% APY on your uninvested cash. So check out the link down below to learn more. I do want to break down your outlook by asset class. So gold will be one of them. So we'll get back to that. I believe when I spoke to uh, Ted Oakley, founder of Oxbow Advisors last, I think he mentioned that you also hold a few large tech stocks. I think Microsoft being one of them. Am I correct? Yeah. So we own Microsoft. We own Apple. We own Alphabet. We've owned those for more than half a decade for clients that have stock portfolios with us. But I think the key with that is we buy when we think we're not overpaying. And so hmm. we were buying tech stocks for our clients in 2022 and the beginning of 2023. But with the incredible run higher that that sector has had in the last 18 months, we probably stopped buying about 12 months ago. I think we stopped buying around May. Yeah. And a lot of those tech uh, positions that we had, you're starting to see a bit of a pullback where uh, the fundamentals are starting to catch up to the share price, but there's still some ways to go. So when we look, we, we want to look for tech positions for new equity clients that we have, but we're not going to jump in when we think that a lot of these positions, especially semiconductor stocks, are still trading maybe 30 to 50% higher than what we think their fair value would be. Okay, so I have a chart here from your slide deck that I'll show to the audience. S&P 500 P ratio remains elevated, and yes, by historical standards, it is high. Um, I remember when I first started working in the uh, macroeconomics research business, one of my first managers straight out of college I was, he told me that valuations were a poor indicator of price. And he showed me this chart showing uh, valuations going up and down and price moving in, you know, whatever direction it wants, just uh, independent of PE. And so he argued that the same point. Same point that you made, it's it's important to be cognizant of valuations, but don't use it as an indicator of price. So how would you respond to that? And I guess the criticism of using a chart like the PE to, to um, make an evaluation as to whether or not to buy or sell simply because something seems elevated in valuations. Yeah, I think probably what that mentor of yours was suggesting is that on a short-term basis, so over the course of 12 months, valuation mm -hmm. has very little predictability. Uh, if the market wants to go higher from here, all it takes is that enthusiasm to continue. People continue to be uh, some of these names higher and higher. Sure. And there's nothing stopping the, the PE ratio from going to 25 or 30, like we saw in the dot-com bubble. Where we look at it is we like to look at things on more of a, a five-year time horizon. And that's where you see more predictability, five mm -hmm. years out, 10 years out. If the starting spot for valuation is this high above the long-term average, inevitably there's going to be a regression back to that average. I don't know if that would happen this year or three years from now or five years from now, but if you're just looking at it and saying, on average, earnings per share of an index like the S&P 500, let's say it goes up six or 7% a year, maybe even 8%, uh, you've got that fundamental growth. But if you're gonna have a regression from 21 times earning, 21 times on the PE back to 17, that's a nearly 20% compression that's a headwind. So over a five-year time horizon, you're probably only looking at an expected four to five percent appreciation rate per year in the index. Well, we can get that for free right now by just owning short-term treasuries. So yes. within yes. the within the index, there are names that are undervalued. There's not a lot right now, but you can find things that you think you can buy at a discount. And that's where we're still trying to pick our spots. But we look at that number broadly because it's a reminder that this isn't some incredible opportunity and you've got to push all of your chips into the middle of the table and really try and take a big swing to make big gains. This is the time to really be prudent and see if something brings that valuation back to a more reasonable level. Um, I think it's important to talk about holding period because uh, depending on what your time horizon is, yes, you may or may not be using certain tools to gauge uh, a buy or sell decision. And so your holding period, I'm guessing, is on the longer side. Can you comment on that? Yeah, we 
ideally could buy something in our stock portfolios that we never have to sell if mm. the stock price doesn't get too out of uh, range of the fundamentals and the fundamentals keep growing at a double digit rate. But on average, I'd say we end up holding something for about three to five years. There are some positions we've held for a decade or longer. There are others that we've sold within a few months if the, the scenario has changed and we just need to get out and move into something else. Uh, but on average, I'd say we're looking to hold something for several years. And that's where we want to get a good entry point and then have some additional fundamental reasons and a high business quality that can generate uh, good gains for us over a, a longer time horizon. I watched an interview um, with Warren Buffett. This was years ago. He, he was giving this interview years ago. This was before Berkshire Hathaway bought Apple. Um, and the reporter asked him, do you regret not having bought Apple over the last decade? And he said something to the effect of, well, um, I buy things that I really, really understand. And at the time, he didn't really understand Apple or tech stocks. And so he said, I'd rather be the captain of a ship um, rather than just you know being on the ship, so to speak. And so I wouldn't buy anything that I wouldn't, I couldn't be the captain of. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question about uh, another, just an example of something that performed really, really well. NVIDIA, do you regret not having bought in something like NVIDIA or any of the other Max 7 stocks last year? Sure. It would have been great if we had bought NVIDIA, uh, but we have a process. There is a process for uh, what we decide to buy and a process for when we decide to sell. And I think it's important, just given how competitive this marketplace is, to have a discipline like that that you stick to. So for our buying process, there's a screen that we run uh, that looks for particularly growth stocks that are at risk of really falling off a cliff. And when NVIDIA bottomed 18 months ago, NVIDIA was on that list of stocks that were at risk of failing and falling even further. Mm -hmm. We don't touch names on that list because there's just too good of a track record. It doesn't work 100% of the time, but too good of a track record that if you're trying to pick from that list repeatedly, it's not going to work out for you. And then as NVIDIA started to take off, because I think this is a good example, and when it really started to appreciate, everyone's trying to update their numbers. And every time we would update our figures for what we think the cash flows the business would generate, uh, it always seemed like the share price was higher than what our new estimation of the intrinsic value is. So if we think we'd be overpaying as the stock really went from 200 to 300 to 400, $500, and now getting up towards 800, um, we're not gonna chase it in that scenario. Uh, so now we've updated our estimates and if it fell back to a certain price that we thought was undervalued uh, and it met our other metrics, we'd absolutely buy it. But it works for us to stick to this process that leads to mostly winners, mostly positions that we generate good gains in, and it keeps our losses small in the ones that do not work out. And that's really all we're trying to do repeatedly is limit our mistakes, keep the misses small, and then give some opportunities to have some, some good or big winners. And one thing to think about when you're working with a portfolio, it's always surprising, even if you know doing this professionally, mm -hmm. the ones that end up being the huge winners are usually not the ones that you think are going to be. If you asked me, for example, you know, give me a 20 picks that I can give for you. Maybe the three or four that I would pick out that I think these will be the really big winners of the next five years, it'll probably be something else in the portfolio. And that's where it pays to just have some humility, just try and be very consistent in your process of what you're choosing. And you're gonna have some that are huge winners, some that don't work out for reasons you didn't see, but keep the losses small, and it'll end up being a good portfolio in the end. Okay, um, would you, have a higher valuation threshold for growth stocks. In other words, would you raise the um, the cutoff for the PE ratio for a stock that you think is more on the growth side rather than the value stock? Yeah, absolutely. I, the, the growth or the expected growth of a company is a huge part of what valuation you're willing to pay. Uh, the profit margins and just how entrenched their competitive position is how recurring their revenue is, they, uh, that they can grow through a cycle and there's not gonna be a lot of cyclicality based on what's happening in the economy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can give a couple of examples. Uh, there are some pharmaceutical stocks that we bought uh, over the course of the last several months that we only wanna pay 10 times earnings for that because they're steady and they're consistent. Uh, at the same time, uh, the one position that we've owned for half a decade, but we recently started buying again for clients because it's pulled back to a, attractive level is Adobe. Uh, and we're buying Adobe as a full position for these new stock clients at 25 times earnings. Yes. Because for Adobe's history, for such a high quality business with a high free cash flow margin,
that's still growing at a mid-teens rate, that's a good price to pay uh, if you think that they can sustain that level of performance. You're never going to get Adobe at 15 times earnings when it's operating like this. So you have to be realistic and really know for each company in each industry what counts as undervalued, and it's going to vary to a wide degree. You have a chart here that summarizes, or a table rather, that summarizes what you've just discussed. Cyclical sectors are most overvalued is the title, and you have here a table of all the uh, sectors of the S&P 500. They're 12 on forward PE, the long-term average of these PEs, and the percentage gap between the uh, forward and the long-term average. And so looking at this, yes, you can see uh, cyclical sectors like IT, consumer discretionary, um, even financials are the most overvalued according to this percentage gap. And things like energy and real estate are the most undervalued. Um, my question is, looking at this table alone, what do you do with this information? Sure. Well, it just gives you a quick view. I think one thing that anyone who is trying to look for new opportunities in the marketplace and they're trying to look at what's worked lately, uh, it's been a lot of the cyclical sectors that have risen by a lot. And it's not just tech. Uh, home builders have had an incredible 18 months. Industrials have done well. That was the only sector besides tech that was making new record highs uh, until recently. So you're looking at opportunities to say, is there anything there? But it's a good reality check especially in these very true cyclical industries like consumer durables, industrials, basic materials, transports. We go through lists of names that we think are high quality companies in those industries. They're all fully valued or above fair value. So that just tells us now's not the time to try and chase and buy anything in those sectors. There will be a reason at some point that causes those stocks to pull back. Wednesday's CPI report was a great example. There were a lot of companies with exposure to the housing industry that were down five or 6% yesterday, that's not enough to make them cheap. But if that correction continued and they end up falling 20 or 30%, we would then start to take a look and see what sort of high quality businesses in that area we might wanna add. But at these prices, you're not really getting a, a great opportunity yet. When so, sorry, please continue. Uh, just, yeah, this last part. So within those other areas that don't look as overpriced, that's where we've been trying mm -hmm. to find opportunities that to add. So consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, energy, real estate is separate. That's such a play on interest rates. And you saw that yesterday when rates went up after the CPI report, the XLRE ETF that covers the REITs industry was down, I think three and a half percent. Those businesses don't really have competitive advantages anyway. So it's not something we really look for to a huge extent. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one that's almost a separate thing to look at. Uh, this analysis could be applied to any security as publicly traded stocks, individual stocks and sectors as well. You've done it for sectors here. But let's say you take a stock and you do the same thing, 12 month forward P versus their historic average. And you see something that's really, really undervalued, like by the order of, you know, minus 30 percent or 50 percent or whatever. Um, how do you make the decision that either you, you should either get in or stay away because it's a value trap? In other words, do you how do you evaluate if something as a good buying opportunity because it's cheap versus a value trap? Sure. You always look at something that's cheap, especially in a market like this, where most stocks are fairly valued or overvalued. If something looks really cheap, your immediate thought should be, what's the catch? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, is, right. what are we making here? And there's actually a good example today. Uh, we're filming this on, on Thursday this week. Uh, Globe Life, which is uh, historically a well-run insurance business, uh, we looked at all the insurers just because, as you see from the CPI report, a lot of these insurers are trying to catch up and increasing their rates they're charging their customers. And that will lead to higher profitability, higher rates are a better environment for them too. So we're trying to see if there's any insurers that have pulled back to a price we think is undervalued. Globe Life, the ticker is GL, was one that looks really cheap. Just why is it so low? Turns out they're going through some uh, very big issues on the more regulatory side. Uh, and it's down significantly again today. Uh, and it just tells you something separate is going on, something more specific to that business that you don't want to jump in, you don't want to play along with that. So you really kind of have to know the environment. If something is trading 50%, 60% below what you think it's worth, there's probably a good reason for that, that it makes it a value trap. Right now with where market's currently trading, you're probably looking for things that are trading more like 10 to 30% below uh, their fair value. And even then, if it's 30% below, you want to know what's the reason and why do I think that it's a temporary issue that will be fixed? So it's a constant, almost investigation to make sure that there isn't something that you don't understand that the market does. Now, I'm guessing the real estate sector is mostly commercial real estate, correct? Um, 
Now, I just want to bring something to your attention. And another slide, you have home price. This is obviously a different sector, residential versus commercial. This is home price versus income. And the, it says the real problem here for real estate is that it's really, really, really expensive. Home price to income ratio, according to this particular chart, is 6.3. But on the other slide, you have real estate being undervalued by 11%. I know we're comparing slightly orange apples to oranges here, but can you maybe just walk us through the discrepancy? Why is, why is the real estate sector overall very overvalued, but... On a valuation basis, uh, if you look at the REITs and stocks, still undervalued. Yeah, they're two separate things, uh, to see what you guessed. So our founding partner, Ted Oakley, brought up the residential real estate market that shows how much home prices have moved ahead of the inflation rate, which if you look at a chart going back 100 years, usually residential real estate grows at about the same rate as inflation. And it's twice that it's happened that the residential real estate market has really eclipsed the inflation rate. The first was the housing bubble in the mid 2000s, and then it came right back to the inflation rate uh, trend. And then what's happened here in the last 10 to 15 years is the second time this has occurred. It doesn't mean that home prices have to fall immediately. Right now, there's such a low inventory of existing homes for sale that that actually is sort of propping up prices in the home market. But if there's something that creates additional inventory of existing homes for sale, we would expect that to lead to a correction in the residential real estate market. Okay. For REIT, yeah, for REITs, those are almost all commercial real estate. So it's multifamily apartments, it's offices, uh, retails like malls, a lot of different industries that are covered in that space. And while they look cheap versus their historic average, uh, as I mentioned, REIT valuation plays so much with the level of overall interest rates. So if interest rates right now are higher than they've been in over a decade, it makes sense that the REITs are also trading at a valuation cheaper than they have on average over the past decade. And you really have to almost make a call on the direction you think interest rates are going to really want to get bullish and want to invest in these commercial real estate uh, stocks. Right now, we think that the trend is still for rates to move higher. Uh, just because people still have to price in that inflation is not going down as quick as they thought and rate cuts are not happening as soon right. as everyone anticipated. So we are very cautious to try and do anything in the REIT space and we we don't really own anything there at the moment. I actually, um, I'll, uh, just, just to support what you just said, I have a friend who works uh, for a major bank running their credit card department. I'm not going to mention which bank or who it is, but he did say that, um, he, he told me that credit card rates aren't coming down anytime soon. Um, for, for a host of reasons. So people were expecting Fed funds rate to come down and then consumer rates to come down as well. Well, I think they'd be disappointed. So um, yeah. you're absolutely right there. Um, okay, I want to talk about um, your outlook now. So first off, what are the major asset classes or sectors that you think have the most or present the most opportunities for investors this year and perhaps into 2025? Sure. So I... I the base of our portfolios of our three strategies uh, continues to be the short-term treasury. Uh, it's been a long time since you've been able to lock in a, a 5% risk-free rate. And we think that's a great starting point when evaluations and a lot of other asset classes uh, appear high to us. So that's always the opportunity cost that you have to find something meaningfully better than that that you think is relatively low risk. So we still like having a high allocation to short-term treasuries. Uh, if you're looking for income, we still like uh, pipelines, uh, positions in the energy sector that deliver a high dividend yield. So there are names like Enterprise Products, Energy Transfer, MPLX. These are all companies that have high single digit dividend yields, very stable cash flow. Uh, and we think they continue to have strong positions and uh, continue to hold those for our, our clients that are looking for income. Precious Metals remains a good space. Uh, we really are particular though, we, we own uh, positions in physical gold and silver uh, in the markets, but we're very particular in what stocks related to precious metals will own. So we're really only looking for royalty businesses because the business model is so attractive. You don't have the same issues with cost inflation that could hurt the profitability of a business like that. And then if you're going to own a gold miner, be very careful about the jurisdictions that the miner operates in. Uh, just because there's a lot of places where there's gold and silver mining done that uh, the government could decide one day that they want to take that mine for themselves. Which so, jurisdictions would those be, Chance? Well, let's flip it the other way because there's so many that that would be an okay. issue. <laughs> uh, 
Agnico Eagle Mines is uh, the the primary gold miner that we own, and that's because they're in they Nevada, have, right? Yeah, North America, Canada. Yeah, they're primarily getting their cash flow from jurisdictions that are more friendly, more democratic, uh, and really, if you try to drift outside of that, it gets more difficult. Uh, and to give an example of one that did not work out for us, uh, and we actually just took a a, a small loss on it. Uh, Franco Nevada, which is considered to be the highest quality precious metals royalty business, yes. has a wonderful track record. They had a copper mine that they had a royalty interest in in Panama that was about 20% of their cash flow. And Panama has basically just taken the mine back. And everyone has had to adjust and just remove 20% of the cash flow from their models for their business. And uh, you had a similar stock price decline with the news of that happening. And that's the sort of thing that you really want to be cognizant of. Um, we, you know, it's unfortunate that happened and that wasn't in our forecast. Uh, but, you know, when something like that occurs, you just adjust and, and look for another opportunity elsewhere. But you really want to be careful in the precious metals market for that reason. You wouldn't take a bet on a junior stock, let, let's say in a very safe jurisdiction like North America, for example. We don't think you have to right now because the larger precious metal miners are trading historically at such cheap valuations. Uh, they're generating such good free cash flow yields, or if you want to look at it on an EV to EBITDA basis, um, just look at a 20-year chart of the valuation of, of a typical gold miner. They typically trade significantly higher than they do right now. Right. And with the gold price having moved as much as it has, eventually the gold miners usually catch up in that trade a bit. So we don't think you have to try and stretch and pick out a junior gold miner when you can focus on the more established ones that are going to be able to ride out any turbulence that might happen in the future. You know, everyone's been telling me, yes, the gold miners have are, are, are undervalued because exactly what you said, the gold price has run up so high. In fact, the gold price, which we'll talk about in just a bit, has run up to new all-time highs. It's just breaching new all-time highs every single day. And yet the GDX index is about 50% of its all-time highs or more than 50% now. But you know, it's it's nowhere near its all-time highs in 2011. And so people say, well, obviously undervaluation from the gold mining sector, but let's flip it around. How do you know that the gold mining sector is undervalued and and not the other way around? How do you know that it's not gold that's overbought and gold mining is fairly valued? I mean, I'm, the equity investors for the gold mining sector are smart people. Maybe they're telling us something. That could be. Uh, they do move together to some extent. And if you looked at a ratio of GDX versus GLD, for example, um, you can't identify times where it looks like GDX is the relatively undervalued. So to your point, it could mean that the price of gold comes back down and GDX does not move higher. Uh, but we would expect, given how far that ratio has drifted to a low level, that those two will compress. And so maybe it ends up being GDX goes up some and gold uh, corrects a bit, especially if you see rates move higher here, maybe it takes a breather after such a good move. But we do know that the gold market, uh, it's a momentum type of market. And so when you are seeing gains in the price of gold on a nine or 12 month time horizon, it usually is in your best interest to bet on further gains. Uh, and when the relative strength index of gold is as strong as it is today, I just saw this this morning. Historically, I believe it's about 85% of the time that the price of gold is higher 12 months later. So it is uh, something that I think uh, we, we know you're paying higher prices if you're trying to buy in today, but we do think it can continue to go higher from here. And to your point about the gold miners just being riskier, there's more room for management mistakes, uh, these companies or other things to create problems. The majority of our precious metals exposure is in actual gold uh, or silver. It's not in the miners or the royalty businesses. So we do think it's important to remind everyone that you know, go to the physical, the actual commodity price in this case, uh, more so than the miners. And then the, the miners and the royalty businesses provide some additional upside if it really takes off. Just on gold, um, I wonder why gold, in, according to your analysis, has moved up the way it has. Um, certainly gold in the past has been a good hedge against equity volatility. In some cases, it's been a good hedge against inflation. It's been a good hedge against um, rising interest rates, meaning if ra rates go down, gold goes up and vice versa. Okay, now all three of those variables have moved counter to what gold would typically expect it to, right? Inflation's come down, rates are going up, and uh, we're real rates, that is. And of course, the stock, mar stock markets are going up, signaling high risk sentiment in the markets. 
in this environment, if you just asked me if I just came from the moon on a trip away from Earth somewhere and didn't look at the markets, I'd say, chance, gold's down like $1,500. It's not 23. Shouldn't be at 2300. What happened there? You're right. The factors you normally look to, we would look at real rates. We would look at, uh, at least for investors in the United States, look at what the U.S. dollar is doing. Usually yeah. you need a weakening U.S. dollar. Um, that would be moving against what you think is great for gold, and yet gold continues to go higher. So I think the the gold bugs out there would say this is a really positive sign that gold's moving higher against these trends that normally would not be good for it. I think there's a case made that that's true. Uh, two things. One, you see central banks and governments around the world buying more gold every quarter than they have historically. So I think there's an institutional demand for gold that's providing uh, some base, some demand that uh, maybe wasn't there in the past, and that's been a positive for the gold price. Um, and I, I think it's just something that we really think, given how much fiscal spending, how much debt the United States, as an example, is taking on, uh, you know, they they got that budget passed, uh, I believe it was uh, sometime last year, uh, in the last year or two, and to see how much the debt uh, on the government has increased uh, trillions of dollars in a short period of time it could be that investors are realizing that maybe the US dollar is strengthening relative to other currencies of other countries, but on its own, all of these currencies are weakening relative to something like gold, uh, just because of sort of fiscal irresponsibility, the defici deficits that are being run. And uh, given that, we think that could also be a driver for why the gold price uh, has been moving higher recently. In one of your um, summary slides, it says here, beware of potential for inflation in the next decade. We haven't talked about inflation much. Uh, why is it that uh, Oxbow thinks that inflation could be uh, recurring or return in the next in the next decade? The main reason is that for a lot of these commodities, minerals, oil, uh, there's just an underinvestment in capex at, to try and drill and, and mine and meet the demand for these commodities. So you could look at it for oil or gold, silver, copper. Uh, and we think part of it might be driven by governments just don't have the same appetite to allow this sort of mining to happen in their jurisdictions. And we realize the desire for clean energy, but uh, to produce everything that you need for clean energy, whether it's solar or wind, uh, those components, you do still require fossil fuels to do the mining, mm -hmm. um, as an example. And for some of the other trends, like electric vehicles, there's a lot of uh, various metals that are required that go into those vehicles that are not being mined enough uh, to meet the demand that's expected over the next 10 years. So usually when there's a structural imbalance like that, uh, as long as the demand holds, you could see prices go higher. And if you're going to see that sort of an issue... Uh, then you're going to have more goods inflation than we had in the 2010s. And then if you flip it and you look at services inflation, one example uh, why you might have services inflation remain sticky is you've had so many people retire since the pandemic, at least the United States. Uh, I think the wealth effect, uh, increasing home values, increasing share prices and everyone's stock portfolios, uh, a lot of people were able to just retire. And that's allowed to be a little bit of a deficit uh, in labor availability that might produce more wage inflation than we had in the 2010s. So if you go through that, those sorts of components, uh, the days of 2% or less inflation for 10 straight years, we don't think that's gonna be the case. And we think that's gonna require everyone to be a bit more nimble in their portfolios and have more balance across their portfolios. Whereas from 2009 to 2021, just owning only growth stocks was all you needed. And that made it very simple, but now we think you need to have some smart allocations across a wider array of sectors and asset classes uh, just to be able to make sure you're, you're generating gains regardless of what's happening out there in the world. Finally, on the US dollar. So we talked about gold. If you're bullish on gold, are you bearish on the US dollar? I think you can make the long-term case, yes, that the fiscal deficits that we're running, the increasing debt levels uh, for the US government that I referenced, I think we're up to $38 trillion, something like that. Uh, those figures are concerning and would suggest that there could be a weakening U.S. dollar uh, further down the road. In the near term, if what we've just discussed earlier about fewer rate cuts or no rate cuts uh, compared to in Europe or in Canada, you might start seeing rate cuts sooner than you will in the United States. 
that relative difference uh, in interest rates will likely lead to increased strength in the U.S. dollar. You're already seeing that here uh, very recently as the inflation stays higher in the U.S. So it might be stronger U.S. dollar holds for a bit longer. Long term, uh, there is some concern that you might get a weaker U.S. dollar if these deficits and high debt levels continue. OK, very good. Uh, Chance, I appreciate your thoughts and insights. Um, oh, actually, before I let you go, I know Oxbow doesn't hold Bitcoin, uh, but you know what? Warren Buffett didn't hold Apple for for more than a decade, so maybe that could change. Have you considered cryptocurrencies at all as part of your strategy? We don't own any cryptocurrencies. I don't expect us to for the foreseeable future. It's one of those things that uh, I think it's, from our perspective, pretty much impossible to value. Uh, you don't have cash flows to work off of. Uh, but we've read enough to understand the case that when you have a finite supply of something like that that's available in a world where there's more and more currency issuance and higher debt levels uh, and fiscal irresponsibility by major governments, right. people may continue to flock to Bitcoin the same way they seem to be moving towards gold. Yes. So we understand if, if somebody wants to do that, but we let our clients decide that on their own outside of what we manage for them. And the only thing I would say is having read multiple asset allocation reports, uh, if you do decide that you want to invest in Bitcoin, I wouldn't have it be more than 2% of your total net worth. This is not something that you want to have 20% of your net worth invested in because the volatility is so high. Uh, it's just, it's too much to handle, but have a very small amount. And then you can see what happens and not get too worried about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the gold comparison. People have likened it to digital gold uh, precisely because neither of those generate cash flow, but have some fundamental attributes that are similar. Um, the Bitcoin ETFs that have launched this year, they haven't enticed you to look into it, perhaps make it easier for you to hold. It hasn't changed your mind at all? No, it hasn't. Uh, I mean, it, it's nice for anyone that wants a Bitcoin that there's an easier vehicle to do that. Yeah. Uh, and to compare it with gold, gold, you've got uh, thousands of years of history that there's been a, a value to gold in the marketplace uh, when fiat currencies uh, have lost value yeah. in a, a society. That may be the case with Bitcoin going forward, but there's such a short term history. Uh, we're not willing to make that call. We'll we'll let our clients decide that for themselves if they want to play along. Final question, I promise. I do wonder, yeah. Chance. Um, you know, you're you're a relatively young guy, successful. Um, your strategy for investing for yourself would that be any different for, let's say, um, and uh, your clients for Oxbow who may be more interested in wealth preservation? The the general the general um, uh, approach that we've been taught in finance, at least when I back when I was in business school, was that. Uh, the younger the client is, the more money he earns uh, relative to his age, uh, the more aggressive an approach he should take relative to an older client who is looking to retire and preserve wealth. And so I'm wondering whether or not you would invest differently for yourself. I think my situation personally is different. I am somebody that wants to make sure it, there's a line that a lot of mutual fund managers don't invest in their own funds. And it's sort of like a chef that doesn't eat their own cooking. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that shows that better performance comes from money managers that are invested alongside their mm. clients in their own funds. So for me, I might be invested more conservatively than someone my age typically would be, but I want to make sure that what I own in my investment accounts uh, mirrors what we own for our clients across their strategies, not just the stock portfolios, but also the income portfolios. Mm -hmm. So that might be less growth in total for my portfolios, but uh, I think it's important that I own the same things that that we own for our, we purchased for our clients. However, for someone uh, in my age, I'm a millennial. I'm in that category. Sure. Um, I, I think of a lot of friends who are married, just starting to have kids. They're not going to need their money for retirement for at least another 20 years. Sure. If you look at uh, that long of a time horizon, it's very low percentage that investing in stocks for the next 20 plus years would lead to uh, any sort of destruction in your wealth. So uh, whenever friends ask me that are my age, they say, you know, just buy and hold uh, diversified stock funds and really don't look at it. Don't think about it. Just keep adding uh, and it'll work out well for you in the long run. I just heard stories of um, one of my guests who runs a channel, crypto channel, and some of his staff uh, working for him um, became overnight millionaires in the last month buying meme coins of the, the meme is just a dog wearing a hat. And this coin does absolutely nothing, and it's a meme, and it went up to the moon, and they're all overnight millionaires. And it just it just makes you think, you know. 
what am I doing with my well, life? <laughs> well, sometimes you have good fortune like that. They actually did a study like that once, just an example. And the key is in something like that, if you can benefit from a mania like that, you have to be one of the earliest people to sell. Yes. If you hold for too long, it's going to all come back down. But if you're that lucky that you got something and you're an instant millionaire, take the gains, walk and move on to something else in your life and just watch your blessings. Uh, the longer you stay, the more likely it is it's going to all come back. Chance, where can we learn more about Oxbow Advisors? Yeah, uh, oxbowadvisors.com, our website. And we also have a great uh, channel on YouTube yeah. if you look for us at Oxbow Advisors. Okay, we'll put the links down in the description below. Always good to catch up, Chance. I'll speak to you next time. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. Thank you for um, watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Oxbow Advisors in the links down below.